My name is Riley White. I'm an associate professor of finance at the University of New Mexico Anderson School of Management, as well as an associate dean at the business school. So when we think about voter behavior, we can go back 30 years and think of the 1992 election between Bill Clinton and George Bush. James Carville, the famous political analyst and strategist, uh, coined the term, it's the economy stupid, in reference to the importance of the economy in swaying voter opinion. Now, voter opinion, though, has many different dimensions into this, particularly as it pertains to the economy. So when people think of the economy, they think of themselves, they think of jobs, they think of security, they think of inflation, something we actually haven't seen affect the political discourse in three decades. And they also think of how the overall economy is doing, something like our gross domestic product, how is the economy growing? Is it shrinking? And even more personal, I think, that affects many people's bottom lines and wallets. They're thinking of their ability to spend money and their comfort at spending money. And we call that consumer confidence. And one of the things that we've struggled in the last couple of years to build back after the COVID-19 pandemic was consumer confidence. And so a lot of people are feeling uh, right now uh, a mixture of different emotions and different feelings with regards to the economy based partly on their own experience, based partly on information they hear about the economy, and then based partly on how the economy overall is actually doing as we measure it. And so that combination of factors sways voter opinion right now. So when, when it comes down to when a candidate is elected, they make a great deal of promises to garner votes, and their efficacy at achieving those votes is one thing, but their ability to come through on those promises is a completely other set of things. But one thing that's worth considering is when we look at the election, we think about the presidential election, but we also have to think about Congress and uh, the ability for an individual party uh, to have their agenda run is highly dependent on that congressional makeup. Um, we've seen many Congresses in our own lifetimes where it's been deadlocked. We We've had, um, uh, you know, one, one area of government is held by one party, another area of government is held by a different party. When it comes down to fulfilling promises, you have a one or two years where ultimately a lot of legislation may or may not be passed. But we're looking at, um, instead of necessarily wide scale changes or wholesale changes to the tax code, they're often very incremental. When it comes down to efficacy, though, the bottom line is a lot of times um, economic, the attribution of economic strength or weakness is incorrectly applied for the president. So sometimes presidents are just lucky because they've stumbled into a situation where they have the right environment to succeed. And other presidents are terribly unlucky when it comes to economic situations. And one, one issue that we find is that a lot of voters do follow along and they misattribute the growth and decline of the economy to presidents when they might not have that much of an effect on the economy at all. think about the uh, metrics that evaluate ec economic policies, we often focus in economics and finance on the metrics that show that the overall economy is doing well. Are we close to full employment? Do we have a low unemployment rate? Um, are we looking at other things like um, is income growing? Are real wages growing? Real wages are wage increases, uh, less inflation. Economic growth is not even. And so even when you have a time of economic growth, it may affect one group more than other groups. And so we look at other issues such as income inequality levels. Uh, are they increasing? Are they decreasing? Are there more people in poverty? Are there fewer people in poverty than before? Economic growth may not rise to the potential that we think it might. Other times uh, we may benefit from international situations, we may be affected by crises, oil crises that happen on the other side of the world, for instance, that can have a detrimental effect on the economic system. And so all of these factors at play, and the big picture is we have a global economy of which the U.S. is a part of. One way we can separate voter groups in particular is by not only demographically, but also by income level, income class. Lower and middle income voters are heavily focused on things like minimum wage. They're focused on um, affordability, student loan debt for middle income folks in particular. Whereas we look at high income people and they're much more focused on individual elements of the tax policy. They're looking for lower taxes. Uh, high income folks have different, um, they get more of their income from investments and things like this. And so they're focused on a very different set of 
the economy than the real day-to-day wages. Lower and middle income Americans are focused on things like childcare costs, healthcare expenditures, day-to-day bills. And we find that even things like inflation in food, uh, in food and, and healthcare and other things disproportionately affects lower and middle income Americans. And so these are at the forefront of their minds. Can I pay off my credit card debt that I have this month? Am I gonna have enough money? Do I have stability in my economic and employment situation in the next future? And a lot of that is, is still important, but less critical for higher income individuals who focus on, say, regulatory changes, how that affects businesses and how that affects the direction and flow of their investments. And so these are different groups of people that different politicians listen to. And you can kind of gauge kind of where a primary audience is when a candidate is looking to court a particular audience, what in the elements they're pulling from this, what elements that they're trying to focus on to gain favor with this audience. This is a fascinating thing. So in aggregate, so one of the things are if you're a finance or economics person like myself and you're just full of numbers, the economy looks in aggregate pretty good. We've had unemployment rates near uh, all-time lows, last 50-year lows, I should say. Uh, it's gone up a bit above 4% unemployment, but it was down at 3.5% for, for much of last year. Um, we have more jobs available than there are people who are unemployed. Uh, we have inflation that's gone from 9% two years ago down to 3.3% uh, right now. And it seems like a lot of these things are moving in the right direction. But here's the thing. We find out, we ask the average American, people are very negative about the economy. So right now, about 22% in a recent survey conducted in late May, 22% of Americans felt that the economy was doing well. 48% felt we were doing poorly in the economy, with the remainder being some mixed amount. And likewise, when it comes down to it, are we getting better or worse in an economic situation? The majority of Americans, over 70%, said our economy is getting worse. And this is very, very important because as much as numbers and aggregates are a thing, personal experience is a guiding factor for voter decision. And this has been shown in various aspects of of research and other things as well. Um, When we think about um, the economic situation, people are focused on inflation, people are focused on employment, people are focused on uncertainty. Uh, We find that in the last few decades, what's been kind of a characteristic of a lot of different elections is people are very partisan about their opinions about the economy. So uh, when your um, preferred candidate is in office, you tend to think the economy is doing well. When you th- uh, when your candidate who's who you don't want to be as an office is in office, you think the economy is doing poorly. And that tends to skew a lot of our perceptions of the economy. So what do we do? And one of the things we can look at is things like what are consumers actually doing? What are they feeling right now? Consumer spending is over two thirds of the U.S. GDP. So it's over two thirds of our economic size. Buying stuff is what we do. And consumer confidence has been kind of has been has been lingering at uh, levels that are below what the aggregate numbers show, meaning that people feel less confident about going out and making purchases, buying things, um, either because they worry about their job, even if they have one, or they're concerned about their future and the economic situation that there is to, that, that's to come. People feel inflation very personally. And that feeling that inflation, that even that price growth of um, now, even though we can say that it's down to 3% year on year, um, in the last since 2020, it is a double digit increase for most consumer products that people feel very poignantly. And, and I think that's dictating a lot of their decision making right now. Um, so I think inflation's a big story, even though it's gone away, uh, most of it, but I think uncertainty, lack of confidence in the economy, and, um, and the messaging that people are hearing from different uh, political avenues is affecting a lot of the voting intentions. It has been such a long time since inflation has even factored in on an election. If we think back to the last 30 years, we haven't really seen inflation become even a moderate factor since basically 1992. It was a bigger factor in the 80s. And I think one of the good things um, to remember about the inflation era is perhaps it's not the same sort of thing. In the 1970s, we experienced stagflation. We had a stagnant economy. We had rapid inflation, really, really high interest rates. And what that meant was it was difficult for people to um, afford take out loans. Mortgages were very expensive. There's parallels. They were not as severe as today, but there were parallels to some feelings that people were feeling today. Um, and that inflation, that stagflation, led to the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980. 
over Jimmy Carter, who was president from 1976 to 1980. So it does affect elections in a big way. And when we think about inflation, we often think about how economists and finance people define it, how inflation has gone up or down in the last year. But people have a memory that's longer than that. And for them, they look at price increases over the last two years, three years, four years. And that helps, that affects the way that they vote and their perception of the economy. This is a really good question. So is inflation bad for the economy? So one of the things, so when we, we our Federal Reserve of Bank of the United States, the Bank of Banks, sets one interest rate, and that's called the discount rate, which is just overnight lending to big banks. That's all it is. But it has a ripple effect on every other interest rate that we have in the economy. The Federal Reserve is ultimately focused on two things. They want full employment, and they want to keep inflation at around 2%. They don't want inflation to be negative. And one reason that you say for something, and this is actually, um, so there's a paper by Robert Schiller, the Nobel Prize winner from 1997, which shows how different um, economist opinions are from normal human being, normal people's perception of the economy. And that they asked economists and said, do you think it's a good thing if prices dropped next year? And most people said, yes, of course, it's great if prices dropped. I would love if prices dropped. Most economists were like, nope, that would be a horrifying thing. And why did they say that? Why is that difference? Because when prices drop, you reduce an incentive to invest in other things. So that happens in a catastrophic recession. And that means that companies looking to build factories and hire people don't do that. Companies looking to expand start pulling back. And we end up in a great recession. We end up in a depression when prices decrease that way. And so that's the lens through which economics and finance people view it. Now, if we look at the other side and we say, well, is inflation a good thing? Inflation of 10% or 9% like we had was definitely a bad thing. And it will make Americans feel poorer every single year. And it's almost impossible to beat levels like that with wage growth. So what's the right number? And so it's likely, we've debate about this in, in a lot of different ways, but some, it's probably low single digits, 2% might be right, 3% might be right. But having a low level of inflation is good because it's something as long as wages can grow faster than inflation, people are making more money than they did last year. But on the other side of it, having a little bit of inflation shows that people are still buying stuff, they're still buying goods, they're looking at economic growth, and companies and investors looking to build things and make the economy hum in the future are gonna find um, more, are gonna use their capital to build and do those things. And so that is the bottom line for why inflation isn't, high inflation is bad, deflation is bad, inflation at a few single digits well, might be okay. <laughs>